Thank you. It's a fascinating exercise as we've been at this now for 10 years and for uh, some of us who were on the early planning committee even a little bit more to go back and I, I took a look at all of the various presentations I'd done through the years. And what was fascinating to see how some of the themes that we're looking at now as a major output and um, a really powerful force of what's happened within the DCO were actually there from the very beginning. And so I, I was fascinated to pull this up and realize that one of the very, very early titles I used was Deep Energy, Deep Life, and Deep Time. And I think what's nice about that is it really does reflect the way, although there were four different divisions and communities, those communities, even from the very beginning, were working together on these problems. And in particular, in our case, as you'll see from some of the work that I'll present, we had the wonderful opportunity to work with both the deep energy and the deep life communities, particularly. And because we do work deep, two, three kilometers deep in the crust, in the oldest rocks on Earth, obviously the question of time was something that was really part and parcel of what we were looking at from the very beginning. Now that said, how do you talk about 10 years in 10 minutes? <laughs> uh, what I want to try to do is group this around some of the major thematic discoveries in the context of the deep carbon cycle that we've had the privilege to work on with many outstanding colleagues who are here and many who aren't. Um, largely because that allows me to leave some time in the end to go to where I really want to go, which is emphasizing not just the discoveries, but in many cases, what I would call the lessons learned or the continuing questions, because in fact, often that learning process is some of the most important science to come out of these kinds of major initiatives. And so what I'll talk to you about then focuses what we've done in the context of these four major themes, water, life, energy, and time. And so specifically, this gives you a sense of the kind of place that we're working at. This is 1.8 kilometers below surface in the Beatrix gold mine in South Africa. But we've worked in mines like this in Finland, Canada, and South Africa down to two and even three kilometers depth, taking a look at water. But water that bizarrely had really flown under the radar of the scientific community until about the 1980s. The miners knew about this. There's records of this kind of phenomenon of saline, energy-rich water, energy being the gas that's dissolved in this water, back over 100 years in the annals of the Canadian Geological Survey. But really, it's only been in the last few decades that scientists have begun to examine it and to understand that it's not a phenomenon related to the mines. The mines and underground laboratories are what allow us to get down there. But this is naturally occurring fracture water, highly saline, coming out of the rock. And one of the reasons we know that, of course, is through the use of the noble gas tools, because these provide us with constraints on the age of those fluids, actually the residence times, and so are able to tell us when we're looking at things that are in hydrogeologic isolation deep in the crust, and when we're looking at things that still have surface connectivity. And so indeed, from the very beginning, this issue of time was deeply integrated into the work that we did on these waters, even from the very beginning, uh, working back initially in the Witz Waters Ran Basin in South Africa with T.C. Onstad and Johanna Littmann as a noble gas geochemist. There we began to take a look at the fluids there in the Witz and see residence times on the order of thousands to even deeper, millions to hundreds of millions of years. But then working with Chris Ballantyne, with Greg and uh, Oliver War, who spoke this morning, looking at very well-preserved sections of 2.7 billion year old crust on the Canadian Shield, there we began to see that we could actually push back and look at fluids located in these systems that had noble gas-derived residence times on the order of billions of years. And of course, what's important about all of this is not just understanding the nature of fluids and of noble gases in the crust, but what this all means in terms of providing these constraints on the timing, the interconnection, and indeed the possible preservation, the timescales on which life forms can be retained in the crust and can actually sustain their biological activity. So the life aspect of all of this was always a deep and abiding part of this. I'm a geochemist, a card-carrying geologist, not a microbiologist, but I was smart enough through the DCO and elsewhere to make sure that I had really smart microbiological friends along with us on this journey. And essentially, part of this has been a big driver to understand the nature of life within these systems. Did a lot of work in the early years in the Witzwatersrand Basin of South Africa, again, largely led by T.C. Onstott and Esteban Hurden and Tom Keat, who's here with us today. 
And then more recently, again, applying these to the even deeper systems and older systems that we've been looking at in the Canadian Shield. And in particular, so for instance, I'll highlight this work using isotope geochemistry to get indirect evidence for the long-term activity of sulfate-reducing bacteria in these fluids in the Canadian Shield at 2.4 kilometers below surface. This was the work of Long Lee. He's now a professor at the University of Alberta, and he too is here today. What was exciting about that is for some of the first indirect evidence for life in these systems. And then moving on to more recently to be able to provide some of the first lines of evidence for life in the present day in these systems, with the recent publication of an MPN study that in fact does show the presence in the modern day of sulfate-reducing bacteria in those fluids as well. And so again, focusing on these themes, because what we really want to do when we talk about these systems is take a look at the habitability. And so the final theme is really this theme of energy. Essentially, I call it the sleeping giant, primarily because these Precambrian rock systems were often thought of, from the point of view of fluids and life, as being geochemically dead and uninteresting. In fact, as you see from that video that uh, Zibel showed earlier, that is the exsolution of hydrogen, methane, and ethane from these fluids. And that's a phenomenon all over the world. And so one of the major themes then focusing on energy was understanding the production of hydrogen in these systems, doing mass balance studies to understand that in fact we've got as much hydrogen coming out of the continents sustaining the deep biosphere from water rock reaction as we do from the marine lithosphere. So really changing our thinking about the continents as a habitability issue. And particularly when you get the question, why hydrogen in a deep carbon observatory? Of course, because the hydrogen is the feedstock for both production of methane, whether that be by adiotic processes or microbial processes. And we've heard a lot of talk in this particular uh, session yesterday about abiotic hydrocarbons. That was, in fact, one of the earliest drivers when we began the work within these systems back in the 1990s and 2000s. These deep systems far away from photosynthetic life at the surface were actually some of the first environments on our planet that we could use in addition to the hydrothermal vents to take a look at abiotic organic synthesis. And so our original work there indeed was focusing on abiotic methane within these deep systems. The DCO over the past 10 years I think has really lit a fire under uh, the expansion of that kind of investigation of abiotic organic synthesis in rocks of all kinds across the planet. And in particular, of course, there's been a lot of talk about this, so I won't go through it in detail, but one of the most wonderful parts of the last two years has been the opportunity to get involved with what I call the adventures in methane isotopologues, the clumped methane research that very much came out of a decision by the DCO to fund three different groups to come up with three different ways to look at these things. Our own work, of course, um, has been mostly involved with Shuhei Onho at MIT and some of the early work by David Wang, and then continuing on with uh, work with Ed Young and his group at UCLA, uh, Janine Nash, Thomas Junta, and some of the others who are carrying on that really exciting aspect of this sort of renaissance of methane that we're seeing. Bringing us to a point that we emphasized at the beginning, but I think is worth emphasizing again, that methane on Earth is produced from a multiplicity of processes, both microbial and thermogenic, both biological in the sense that they derive their original feedstock from life, but then abiotic processes as well. But interestingly, one of the things I think we still need to emphasize even 10 years in is the multiplicity of abiotic reactions. Some are related to mantle-derived high-temperature processes, but in addition, as you've seen in the examples I've given today, a large number taking place in the crust, far away from mantle input, but driven by low to moderate temperatures of processes of water rock reaction. And I think it's important to continue to emphasize that although all mantle-derived methane is likely abiotic, not all abiotic methane is mantle-derived. And sometimes that distinction is still not as clear in the literature as I think that uh, the work of the DCO will make it eventually. So just to finish then with a couple of quick lessons learned from all of this, I think one of the most fascinating things about this is we are actually still in the exploration phase of this planet. I could go on about this for an hour, but I'll just give you two quick examples of what I mean there. As we've seen, life and the planet are not as we know it or as we thought we know it. 
We had two quick examples of that yesterday. I mean, these work within the deep subsurface continents. This is where we're coming up with the kinds of things that Mitch highlighted yesterday. Turnover times suggested to be on the order of tens of thousands of years. Very unexpected result. Similarly, of course, some of the wonderful work coming out of the marine systems showing us the discovery of things like the Lochearchia, providing this gap, providing us with information on the evolution from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. So we're still discovering new things about life and indeed discovering new things about the planet because as we go in and open our eyes, much of what we do is empirically derived. And this will be important too as we go into taking a look at these big data sets and the use of AI. And we need to continue to remember that inherently we are empirically derived. We know that what we have seen. And if there are environments we haven't fully explored, such as for instance the ancient continents, this can challenge our preconceptions. Oliver War gave a nice example of this this morning in his lightning talk, where he talked about this idea that years ago, of course, geologists have always been used to the idea that we can get snippets of ancient fluids and gases from inclusions formed at the same times as the rocks. But over the last few years, we begin to discover that, in fact, we have another set of samples, macroscopic, flowing water, like the video that I showed you, that also contains, in fact, remnants of the ancient parts of our planet. So if you've ever had the desire to drink a glass of water that has a xenon atmospheric signature associated with a two billion year old neon and a mass independent sulfur isotope fractionation, come see us in Toronto. We have liters of the stuff sitting around the lab. So unusual, game changing, things we hadn't thought about because we hadn't explored them. The miners had, but the scientists were late to the party. And so again, context matters. There, these are a set of slides which I'll go through very quickly because I think they actually just re-emphasize some of the things that, for instance, came up in uh, Fumio's talk a moment ago and some of Peter's work as well. We're, we're used to taking a look at geological context, but we're less used sometimes to thinking about the follow the water principle. The deep biosphere will have, like the geosphere does, different boundaries, and the life that we see associated with those different boundaries will be different. Geochemical and isotopic tracers can allow us to follow those water, define those boundaries, and distinguish between where we might see near surface recharge and the mixing of surface water or ocean water within the sediments. Nice example of that, again, Mitch yesterday said, and we saw an example from Fumio, that in fact aerobic processes are part of the deep subsurface. And really that's not that much of a head scratcher if you think about it in this context we can definitely identify where it may be subsurface, but is still hydrogeologically connected to either the ocean water or the surface waters. And in those kinds of systems, of course, we are going to see the remnants of that aerobic processing. And then as you go along, of course, getting deeper, looking into regional transport, or even into these systems in which you actually end up with true hydrogeologic isolation from the photosphere on different time scales. By thinking about everything we do with those kinds of context, I think we can actually move beyond the idea that the geochemistry or the mineralogy or the rest of this is, is sort of metadata. And this is the point that I'll end on. Uh, much of the discussion that we made has come out of some of the work that Rick Colwell is leading on the synthesis of data around the uh, census for deep life. We've been bemoaning the fact that the metadata was either not collected or collected later or collected in a way that it was separate from the microbiology. I think what we really need to do is to change the name of this and change the idea. We need to recognize that all of this data that allows us to identify the different biogeography of the subsurface is really needs to be integrated from the beginning as it allows us then to do hypothesis-driven investigation. And just a quick for instance, to distinguish when we get data back, are we looking at the deep subsurface or the deep subsurface in isolation? Or are we looking at surface life gone underground? Both equally important to our understanding of the planet, but understanding where and how and the timescales of that is indeed will, what will lead us, I think, to perhaps being able to address once again some, one of the big issues that Mitch raised yesterday, which is the question of motility. To understand motility, we need to understand not only what the organisms can do, but we need to see where they've gone. And to do that, we need this spatial and temporal context. And so with that, I'd just like to finish with this quick fascination. Wonderful to see over the last couple of days the extent to which having worked so hard on this planet, 
we're now understanding that there are more planets to get to. And so it's very exciting to see those themes of astrobiology and planetary science coming out of everybody's talks. And with that, I'd just like to thank all the huge number of colleagues that worked on this with us over the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for a fantastic talk. Do we have one question? I can't see anyone coming up, so in the interest of time, we'll move on. But thank you very much again, Barbara. <laughs>